Greeting the saints in the matchless name of the resurrected and glorified Messiah Jesus, who is the Christ. It's a privilege to be here. And for the record, I'm not wearing pink. This is fuchsia. <laughs> it's got purple and red and stuff in it. So. Um, I'm going to get straight to the word. Uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John chapter 1. We will be looking at verses 6 through 8. Let me know when you're there. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe because of him. John was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. You may be seated. The title of the message is The Gospel of John, Part 4. The Gospel of John, Part 4. Pray with me. Eternal God, we are rebels against truth from the moment of conception. As we seek to examine and grow from your word, please break through our sinful nature. Give us a mind to comprehend and a heart to receive and actually appreciate what you are trying to say. Please help somebody, and if it be your will, please save somebody. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I had been in a series dealing with the Gospel of John. I don't know how many of you all have been following it, but uh, parts one through three are out there on the internet. And i got to say that I'm getting messages every other week from Christians, from non-Christians, different parts of the country, different countries and other areas of the world, that this particular breakdown of this gospel is doing something positive in a couple of lives. And to God alone be the glory. Like Eddie Kendrick, we're going to keep on trucking. I can't get laughter out of that. That's fine. The opening joke bombed. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, no mercy laughter, please. In scripture, we have four divinely inspired historical accounts of the person we know as Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew begins with a genealogy. Mark begins with an account of John the Baptist. Luke begins with a dedication to his paymaster, Theophilus, that gave him the cash to do the interviews, to do the research. John, however, different than all the other ones, begins with an 18-verse preamble. It's a prologue. The biography hasn't even started yet. It goes all the way back to before time and space began. It's setting the stage. It's building up so that by the time you hear what Jesus said, by the time you see what Jesus did, you know from the beginning that this is God. Before we get to what he did, before we get to what he said, we have to know who the heck he is. Why? Because down the road, as you look at, deeper at the Gospel of John, you've already got it impregnated in your brain that the one doing this is God. The one saying this is God. Who he is adds the meaning to what he does. and Who he is adds the authority to what he says. It's like John's trying to tell us from the very start of the story, before we even get into it, let's get one thing straight from the beginning. Jesus is God. Now that we've established that, let's look at his life. And it opens it up for you. I actually submit that you won't understand the good news of Jesus Christ in its fullest, its most complete, its most rewarding sense. Unless you first see him properly from the very beginning. Yeah. Jesus Christ is God. He's the God of Judaism. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses, manifested in the flesh. Therefore, his words are the words of God. His deeds are the deeds of God. The first 18 verses are that essential buildup. And they're going to open the door to understanding the rest of the book. It's brilliantly constructed. I drooled just reading it. It's, it's a real treat. The DNA of the entire human race existed in Adam. When he stood in the Garden of Eden, we were standing in the Garden of Eden with him. Uh -huh. When he received curses for disobeying God, we received curses for disobeying God. When you think about a baby you know who's been born with fetal alcohol syndrome or addicted to meth or addicted to crack, that baby never touched a drink, that baby never touched a drug, but they still feel the full weight and they still bear the full scars and they still inherit the full consequences of what mom did on that baby's behalf. Yes, sir. I know yes, that's sir. a crude illustration. I pray that it works. I, I, if it needs help, please someone tell me, but uh, I, I, I think it illustrates it. But in Genesis 3.15, we get our first flicker, the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, right? 
Somebody's coming to fix it. Somebody's going to be physically born that's going to save us. Paradise lost is going to be recovered. Everything we suffered and everything we lost as a result of sin is going to be made whole. It's going to be made right. God says to the serpent about Eve, I'm paraphrasing, somebody's going to be coming from her. Even though you're going to bruise his heel, he's going to crush your head. The bruising on the heel means that the person that's going to be born to save us, he's going to defeat Satan ultimately, but he's going to get hurt in the process. That's, that's, what, we, that's what the ancient rabbinic commentators say. So even in the Garden of Eden, the wheels are already turning to bring about a, a God-authored salvific solution that goes all the way back to the beginning. He wasn't blasted by surprise when man sinned. He was already knowing ahead of time. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Eve gives birth to Cain. We all know about that. I'm not a King James kind of guy, but the King James says, uh, I've gotten a man from the Lord. The word from isn't there, just like the word with isn't there, if you got a different translation. It literally says, I've acquired a male child, Yahweh. She thought she was giving birth to that baby from Genesis 3.15 that was promised, that was going to crush Satan's head, that was going to get hurt in the process, that was going to save humankind, that was going to save the planet. And if you notice, when she has the baby in her hand, she calls him Yahweh. She didn't have a Genesis through Revelation. She didn't have a Bible. She was still living out what's happening in Genesis. But where did she get her teaching? She had direct access to God. God taught her her theology. So from the very beginning, what did Eve believe that she was waiting on? Someone who was going to be born, who was going to be Yahweh in the flesh. Now, when it comes to God incarnating himself, every schmo you meet who's watched an A&E or history documentary, they... They, very dumb, like, yes, Christianity was invented by the ancient Greeks. Christianity was invented by the ancient Romans. Christianity was invented by the ancient Egyptians. Christianity was invented by white Europeans. Instead of pin the tail on the donkey, they're playing pin the pagan source onto God taking human form. They can't decide on which one they want to attribute it to, but they're so frantic and so desperate, it has to have a natural source. Otherwise, we're left with, wow, we've got to face the consequences of, of the teaching. They can't handle it. They're willing to believe a stupid documentary made by somebody in their mother's basement when they wrote the, their name on the orange juice. They believe the facts. So I'm like, who dropped you on your head? Who deprived you of oxygen to where you'd be able to believe such horse manure? It's not even true. Especially when it's clear from the, from the book of Genesis that Christianity came from God. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Now when this baby messed around and killed his brother, the first homicide in the history of the world... It became obvious this coming Yahweh in the flesh who's going to recur reverse the curses of the fall. He was going to take a little bit longer to show up than we initially thought. So over the next few thousand years, we get 39 scrolls coming down one at a time. We know it today as the, new, as the Old Testament, rather. But each new scroll as it comes down, as it is revealed, we get more details about this coming Savior, this divine Messiah. And it's interesting, humankind is so screwed up and so evil and so gone that God himself is the only one that can save them. We learn a little bit more. He has to be born of a virgin. He has to be born specifically in Bethlehem. He has to be stabbed in the back by a close friend for some silver. He has to spend some time in Egypt. Each detail makes it more and more specific, more and more surgical. It can only be one person. Then you arrive at Isaiah 40. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way for Yahweh, and in the desert, a straight highway for Elohim. You combine that with Malachi 3.1, watch out, I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. The ancient rabbis all agree when you look at the commentaries, these two passages are messianic. What does that messianic mean? It means it has to do with the coming Messiah. The rabbis understood this to be God telling us, that our coming God in the flesh Savior was going to have a forerunner that came before him. And I'm not talking about Toyota. Okay. Thank you for laughing. Okay. Well, before the Messiah gets here, God's going to send us a prophet ahead of time. The ministry of that prophet is going to be specifically to point us all towards the coming of this Messiah. The Old Testament prophets were talking about a Messiah is coming somewhere down the road. This prophet was going to say, the Messiah is here. You need to repent. We're going to break down the passage and then we're going to make like a tree and leave and maybe we can all beat the other denominations to the restaurants. John chapter 1 verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
I'm just going to clarify in the event that anybody under the sound of my voice might need me to do so. Although the apostle John is writing, he's writing about John the Baptist. There's two dudes named John, two separate dudes. Apostle John is one guy, John the Baptist is another. I don't want anyone to confuse them. I used to do it when I was a youth until someone showed it to me. Um, but as you can see, this forerunner that Isaiah prophesied, that Malachi pr predicted, hundreds of years before it happened, mind you, was sent by God. Israel hadn't heard from a prophet at this point in 400 years. Prophecy was getting set to make a comeback. Verse 7, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe because of him. So the word... Witness is martur, mar, marturion. There's different ways to pronounce it. But if we get the word martyr from it in English. It means he's a witness of the caliber of the zeal to the point that he died if the job required it of him. And as you read later, it did require that of him. The fact that a forerunner was necessary for us to try to see the Messiah lets us know that people stuck in sin and people stuck in darkness have such spiritual blindness that they need someone set apart, called, and gifted by God to literally point them in the direction of light because they love darkness. On their own, they not only wouldn't be able to see it, but they wouldn't want to see it. John the Baptist is, they call him the last of the Old Testament prophets, and his whole life and ministry was dedicated to the goal that national Israel's people might put their trust in the coming Messiah that they, they've been waiting on and reading about for thousands of years in the scrolls, the law, the writings, the prophets, etc. has been all about this individual and he's here. You should be able to see him because you've been waiting on him. Like the songwriter says, let earth receive her king. Yeah. And while I'm passing by the subject, I'm going to drop this on you. John the Baptist isn't here to testify about the light so that all might believe in 2022 you know who inherited that job you, did. you guys did i'm gonna hit you with the question the past week how'd you do it did you do a good job or do you need some work i'll let you chew on that and think about it all right verse 8 john was not the light but he came to testify about the light so john the baptist was the carrier of the message but jesus was the subject of the message why does why is he saying this because Sometimes people be falling in love with and following the messenger to the point that they lose focus of the true meaning of the message that he's saying. Yeah, yeah. John the Baptist, though he's an important dude, he was not the Messiah. He was simply the prophet preaching about the Messiah. And if you look at it, Apostle John is going way out of his way to make sure that his readers understand that Jesus Christ is Michael Jackson. John the Baptist is Tito. It's like Jesus Christ is the focus. John the Baptist is not the focus. If you look at Acts 19, the first seven verses, I'm not going to go over them. It records Paul running into a group of people who had been disciples of John the Baptist out in the desert. And they stayed out in the desert and they missed the whole life and times and ministry of Jesus Christ. And they were still out in the desert following John the Baptist, even after John the Baptist was dead, even after the resurrection of Jesus, even into the church age. And to this very day, if you make a trip to Iraq, you will find the same group of people. It's their great, great grandbabies, obviously. In 2022, John the Baptist is exalted as the savior to these people. I'm not even kidding. It still exists to this day. But, and they're hostile towards Christianity, by the way. But before God does something big, whether there's about to be a huge paradigm mega shift, whether there's about to be a big judgment, whether there's about to be something, a uh, big change, he always raises raises up and gifts and sends out a communicator, a warner, to, to tell the world to get ready for it. And that's what he did with the life and ministry of John the Baptist. I'm getting set to close. But uh, you're lucky to live in a time in which you have the entire encyclopedia of 66 scrolls bound into one volume, telling you with a unified voice that you're a sinner who stands guilty in the sight of a holy and just God. You, you're going to stand before your maker one day. You're going to stand trial. You're going to be made to explain yourself. You're going to have no defense. You're going to have no excuse. You will be sentenced. Think about the worst pain you've ever experienced in this lifetime. That's going to be made to look like Disneyland in comparison to what's waiting. And judicially speaking, you deserve all of that and more. 
Every word that ever left your mouth, every thought that's ever run through your brain, every motive that's ever energized your heart and your soul to, to perform an action, every action you've performed in your body, every day over the decades of your entire life, it's all going to be put under the microscope and made bare. Anything that was done or said or thought that was not like his perfect sinless nature is going to be viewed by him as a capital crime against him. How many death sentences do you have coming to you? Tens of thousands? The good news is that God the Son in the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth lived a sinless life on your behalf. He obeyed the law on your behalf. He was nailed to a Roman cross on your behalf. He stayed in the grave for three days. And that early Sunday morning, he got up out of the grave with all power in his hands. One day you're going to stand in judgment this Resurrected, this glorified Messiah can be the defense attorney that gets your charges dropped. Not based on your work, not based on anything having to do with you, but having to do with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The debt that you owe for your crimes against God has been paid in full. Won't you receive it today, brothers and sisters? And then you can cross the river and study war no more in the celestial city. Reunite with your grandparents and great-grandparents who prayed for you and had you on their mind. And that's why you're sitting right here right now. You'll be at the feet of the Messiah, worshiping and praising and singing for eternity. Come and accept the life-saving truth now while you have the chance. The door of the church is open at this point. May the one true and living God of Scripture bless and keep you and your families.